John Bull Dow was once a lost boy, uh, one of the almost 30,000 who fled the killing in southern Sudan in that country's long and painful civil war. And he's one of the lucky ones. About two million of his people were killed by government troops and Arab militias. The lost boys trekked to refugee camps in bordering Ethiopia and Kenya, enduring unbelievable horror along the way. And after a decade stranded in the camps, think of that, a decade, John was resettled in Syracuse, New York, and his story was told in a documentary called God Grew Tired of Us. His memoirs got the same name. John endured culture shock you cannot imagine. A person without culture is like a, a human being without land. From Sudan to Syracuse, but he's come out on the other side determined to work for change. He has started three nonprofit organizations raising money to help other lost boys get health care and education. Ladies and gentlemen, John Muldow. I have been to Syracuse, New York, sir. It's a culture shock for me. <laughs> for you to, to end up, I mean, talk about the change that your life went through when you came to America. Yes, of course. Uh, when I got to the United States, of course, to Syracuse, New York, very, it's very cold. Uh, uh, <laughs> The, the winter itself was very, very cold. Many people in Syracuse have been asking us, of course they know us very tall and very black. They know us, we are from Africa. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and what they said, hey, are you from Africa? We say, yes. And we said, have you ever seen snow? Uh, we normally say, no. Some people say, oh my goodness, why do they bring them here? They're supposed to take them to Arizona or California. <laughs> I bet you somewhere in December you said the same thing. That's correct. What, what, what happened when you saw snow for the first time? Well, I think it, it happened some, sometime at, uh, at my church. People announce it every single Sunday. Hey, help Sudanese, give them heavy, heavy stuff because yeah. uh, winter is coming. So every, you know, people have been buying all these globes and heads and heavy yeah. stuff and boots. Later, it, you know, there was snow in East Syracuse. Cindy from my church came and said, John, I will take you to see snow for the first time. I said, yeah, let's go. I jumped into her car, and we drove to East Syracuse. Yeah. My surprise, I saw something, something white on the floor, I mean, on the ground. Yeah. And I, I just went there and then kind of squeezed it, it just water. As I was doing that, Cindy, you know, got a bunch of snow and threw me, you know, threw a, a, a snowball. A, a snowball. Yeah. Amazing. And, <laughs> Hey, come see snow for the first time, and she pops you with a snowball. Yes. <laughs> that is a true North American experience, sir. Right, right. Right there. And I did the same thing. I grabbed a bunch of snow also. I threw it with a hair. So we exchanged snowballs, and very few minutes, I felt my hand is kind of numb. <laughs> did she you know, introduce you to the slush ball? Because it's very different. No. You yeah. say, OK, you save the slush ball for somebody you don't like. Snowball for Cindy, slush ball for other people. Yes. Um, and so what happened? I said, oh, OK. So when I said, we've got to go home, and she smiled, and then we, we jumped into her car. I said, oh, before we go, there, was the, there were two lost boys back in our apartment. So I got the bunch of snow and I put it in the trunk of the car. And then, and, and then, we, and then we, drove, we, drove, uh, we drove home. Yeah. Uh, when we got outside there, I said, hey, Jacob, Andrew, come out, see snow. They came out, and I got that bunch of snow in the trunk of the car, and, and, and we look at it. You know, later we decided, uh, well, we take it inside. We took it into our room, uh -huh. and then put it on a dining table. Yeah. <laughs> five minutes later, five minutes later, the snow started melting. It was yeah. a very stupid part of, uh, you know, but that's what I call a cultural shock. Yeah, no kidding. It's, it's, and uh, there's a lot more to it than that, I'm sure. What was it like for, for your community and your church when you first came? Like, not, not the environmental things, but what you experienced and what you had to go through, most people can't comprehend that. Oh, yeah, I got to tell you, man. When we got to Syracuse, before we came to Syracuse, there were so many wrong perceptions about North America, about America. I'm not going to talk about that now, maybe later. But when we got to, to, uh, to the airport, we got out of the corridor, people from my church were waiting for us outside. And then they grab us, and then we got to jump into a, their cars, and we drove to uh, our apartment. Mm -hmm. I got to tell you, that was the first, I have to be honest, first time for me to see uh, light, first time for me to switch like electricity. off. electricity. Yes. I have never seen, you know, something like that. And so they show us everything, twist that push the other one, all those appliances. And later, later, you know, they took us to a grocery store just nearby. 
at that time it was called Peters. And as I was following Susan and Maya, we came closer closer to uh, this, uh, this door, and all of a sudden, a magic door opened itself like this. <laughs> the automatic doors. <laughs> yes, I, 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 I was amazed. And um, you know what I was thinking? I said, okay, maybe Americans are very, very, very lazy. They don't want to pull the door or pick the door. <laughs> You know, John, you're not wrong. <laughs> Your first analysis is not wrong. Uh, but coming to America, let me read fr from the book, uh, God Grew Tired of Us. You have this line where someone said, America is powerful when you go there. Learn how it became the most powerful nation in the world. Go to school. If you want, you can join the military. Learn about power so you can come back and teach us. You can come back and be governor and deliver us from the Arabs. Tell me about that. Well, it, it, it was because uh, in, in southern Sudan, the uh, war had been going on for 22 years. Mm -hmm. And so we, we were in that quagmire where nobody was coming to help us out of that, you know, that problem. And so they knew once you are in the United States or North America, let's say Canada or so, then you become more, you, well, because you go to school and then you, be, you become more educated more powerful, of course, when you decided to go to the military, mm -hmm. uh, join the military, uh, so you become more powerful. And they think that once you are in North America, you become a better powerful person, and then maybe you could come back, like, like our leader. Mm -hmm. Our leader, uh, his name is Dr. John Garang, who came to the United States and went to school there, get his bachelor, his PhD, and went back to Africa, and of course liberate us. From is, that, is that something you want to do? Well, uh, let's see what, what, what will happen. Uh, it has to remain to be seen. The, the, you are the third son in your family? Correct. You have become a leader of sorts in your, I mean, and I'll ask you after this to, to tell me the story about leading the, the children out of, you know, one of, your, one of your big moves. You were the leader. You would not have been a leader in your family because you're the third son. That's correct. Uh, of course, in Dinka, uh, when, I, when I talk about Dinka, it's my tribe. Mm -hmm. Well, all, all the time, like other tribe, that if father is there, mother is there, and all of the, all the son is there, they are the one taking care of everything at, ha at home, like take, negotiating uh, dowries, like uh, doing, uh, you know, pursuing other things. They make a decision. I, the third son of my father, I would have never been to a position where I can help others mm -hmm. or where I can be a leader. And so, because I was separated from my family, now I became maybe a, a first son among the lost boys. What happened there? Tell, tell me uh, the story of you becoming the leader. Well, what happened is my, uh, uh, you know, there has been a war in southern Sudan. The war started in 1983, the one that ended in 19, I mean, of course, 2005. Yeah. It happened that, of course, the government of Sudan had been fighting the southerners. And as they doing so, they have been you know, attacking villages, including my own village, and of course other Sudanese, maybe now in Canada, mm -hmm. and also others in the United States. So they attack our village, and from then, I was separated from my, my family when I was 13 years old. So I took my own way and met with other lost boy on the way. We were going to Ethiopia. It took us three months from my village to Ethiopia on bar foot. There was nothing to eat. We only live on... Uh, you know, wild fruits, chewing grass like animal. Because mm -hmm. the situation reduces us to that, you know, sense of, uh, of uh, you know, can't find something to eat. At night, there's nothing you cover yourself because all those belonging, clothes and, and, and blanket were taken away, mm -hmm. were, uh, were looted. And so, in the way, uh, for example, the uh, thirst, there was no water. And I remember some of the, my, boy, my, uh, my guy, uh, friend from Sudan mm -hmm. died on the way because of thirst. We, I myself, I ate mud so they stay alive. Some of the lost boys also mm -hmm. did so, and of course lost girls. And so on our way, so many people being killed, others eaten by wild animal at night. Did you go through the river and you were watching an alligators and you watched? That's correct. Uh it, that correct? If you, some of you might have watched National Geographic Channel where uh, wild bees crossing the rivers in mm -hmm. Africa, that's what happened. And it happened when we were in Ethiopia, and the government of Ethiopia was overthrown and we were uh, asked to go back to our country. That was in 1991. Mm -hmm. And then we came back, we came almost to come back to southern Sudan, we stopped at a place called Gilo. Gilo is a river infested with a lot of crocodiles. One day, uh, as we were trying to, to cross the, uh, the river, uh, we, um, 
of course, there was no way to, there was nothing to use, you know, to cross the yeah. river. So it took us three days. And then the government of Ethiopia <laughs> sent troops up to us and started shooting at us. Some of us dived into the water, others didn't want to be captured, to be taken to Khartoum. Mm -hmm. So some of us were shot and killed, others drowned, others eaten by crocodiles, others uh, captured, and others lost. You know, we lost more than maybe about uh, 5,000 uh, lost boys, lost girls, and some of the adults. You know, when you get to, you get to North America and you, this is your reality, so this makes you the man that you are and it makes them the women that they are. There are still you, uh, meetings, do you get together some of the lost boys and lost girls now in the States? Because I assume, because there are still problems, even though the Civil War in the North and South is gone, Darfur is still a problem. Uh, you know, you know, in, in Sudan right now. Do you guys have meetings? Is there is there a conversation that's trying to move this forward in Sudan? Yes, we do. We do have some meeting here in, uh, of course, in Syracuse, in some other areas in the United States, of course, even in Canada. We sometime, maybe after two months or after two years, we call a meeting of people coming together. In those meetings, we have to talk about the future of our country, which is southern Sudan. Mm -hmm. We talk about how we uh, make sure that you keep your culture as a Sudanese, keep your culture and also make sure you also adapt to other cultures such as uh, North American culture. Mm -hmm. So those are the things we talk about and then also to build our country. It is us who can make sure that country is being rebuilt. So we talk about all of this and when we talk about not losing culture, uh, we, you know, wait until you see what is a good part of American culture. When you have more time and, and, and get to know what is good and what is bad, you will be able to make a good decision. What do you do then recognizing that the government in Khartoum, who wields such a heavy hand in that country, um, is still the government in Khartoum? So how much progress can actually be made? I know after a long civil war, there's been, there, there, you know, it ended between the North and the South, but there are still some significant challenges ahead for that country. And the people in charge are part of the problem. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, I have to also give a credit to North America, and especially United States and Canada, and, and UK, and uh, Aust Australia, uh, and some other countries in East, uh, East Africa. They brought peace between Northern Sudan and Southern Sudan in 2005. That peace was signed. Mm -hmm. That's a great thing. That's a, that, that's a good step, one good step. That's not enough. And so that the government, which, is, which caused all those atrocities in southern Sudan and now in Darfur, is still doing that, and they are still there. And so these guys are still there. And so if to change this situation, mm -hmm. it will be number one, first, Sudanese themselves. They got to go to school here, do other things, make relationship here, be friend of other, you know, Western world, you know, uh, uh, countries here, and then we go back. We go back and bring the rule of law, bring the dem democracy in South, in, in Sudan, you know, make sure that people uh, uh, are taken care of, because that government is incapable. It's not doing anything at all. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming. It was great to see you. Thank you, John Dow, everybody. You can see John Boldow speaking at a benefit called uh, for the For the Life Foundation. It's happening in Toronto on Saturday, October 25th, uh, along with the Toronto Mass Choir. Go see it if you can. The hour will be right back.